Ogni giorno nei laboratori di biologia svizzeri vengono prodotte decine di terabyte di dati. Una piccola parte prosegue il proprio ciclo vitale e viene effettivamente utilizzata per nuove scoperte. La grande maggioranza è invece messa da parte, dimenticata. Ma che cosa succede a tutti questi dati scartati? E soprattutto, è possibile riciclarli? Smoke. Mi chiamo Simone Pengue, sono un biofisico e mi occupo di dinamica delle proteine. Studio e lavoro all'Università di Basilea e come tutti i ricercatori di biologia ho compiuto centinaia di esperimenti prima di arrivare ad risultati convincenti. Ma per presentare la mia tesi alla comunità scientifica devo comporre una stretta antologia dei miei migliori dati. In alcuni casi gli esperimenti sono falliti, in altri si trattava solo di prove preliminari o tentativi inconclusivi. Ho dovuto mettere tutti i file che ho prodotto in una cartella di un server, anche quelli che per qualche motivo ho deciso di non utilizzare. Francamente, non so né dove finiscano né perché mi sia stato chiesto di farlo. A volte mi domando perfino se non sia meglio cancellarli. Ma forse il ciclo di vita dei dati non finisce qui. Dopotutto, tra i rifiuti informatici degli scienziati, ci potrebbero essere immagini al microscopio che rispondono a più domande di quelle per cui sono state create, o sequenze genetiche che nascondono informazioni su una malattia rara, o semplici test che prima o poi anche qualcun altro affronterà inutilmente nella stessa identica maniera. Informazioni dimenticate, che sono state generate collateralmente senza avere il tempo, la lungimiranza o magari la capacità di utilizzarle, eppure in altre mani potrebbero diventare preziose risorse scientifiche. Per capirne di più, parlo con il dottor Michael Podvinez, a capo della piattaforma tecnologica del Biocentrum dell'Università di Basilea. Biologists are butterfly collectors in a way, you know, there is this sense of I'm observing this and that and the other thing and I want to keep it all and it all is relevant in a, in a larger context. But uh, the issue with this is you're creating more and more data that you somehow need to be able to, to handle, to store and to, to manage long term. Some is stored in lab books, people still sometimes use lab books, some is stored on on, on individual computers, that's probably not such a good idea. Um, what we try to convince scientists at the University of Basel, or at the Biocentrum at least, is that all the data that they want to keep, that they want to work long term with, should be stored on central, so digital data should be stored on central um, storage systems that are provided by the university. Okay, but at this point, who owns the data? By and large, the data is owned by the university. But of course, that means in all, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, the data is owned in the sense of who does something with the data and who's allowed to do something with the data. This is primarily the head of the research group who manages the data. This is the researcher themselves who, who manage the data. Nowadays, we've had groups that within one and a half years created 650 terabytes of data. So it's a lot of data. It needs to be managed. It, it can be an infrastructure challenge. I think the, the much trickier challenge is actually um, organizing the data and knowing what you have where. And I mean, for me, this is always like uh, my iPhone is, <laughs> if you look at my, if I look at my iPhone, I have like, uh, i don't know, a couple of thousand pictures on there because I take pictures with my camera wherever I go and I really never delete them. And uh, to find something becomes increasingly challenging. And 
with the phone, you have like these smart systems. They try to figure out which people are on this, uh, which people are on this picture. Where was that picture taken? So, in brief, what what your telephone, what your smartphone tries to do is provide you with metadata about your images, and that's I think the key. To, to proper data management, especially if your data sets get larger and larger, is metadata, data about data, knowing who did it, when, why, um, what's on the picture, or what's in the file, what's the format of the file, what's the subject that was studied, what, what, in what experiment, in what context, all this information, if we don't have that, then we just have a file somewhere on a hard disk that in five or six years nobody knows what it was and what format it is in. Insomma, sembra che sia davvero importante fare la raccolta differenziata dei dati attraverso i metadati, i dati sui dati. È solo così che possiamo sapere cosa sta dove ed eventualmente riciclare le informazioni in futuro. Ma ancora non mi è chiaro quale sia il ciclo di vita di questi file dopo che chi li ha prodotti si comincia a dedicare a qualche altro progetto. Mm-hmm, interesting, but so this brings us to the next point. Uh, what is going to happen to this data in 10, 20, maybe 50 years from now? So why do you want to keep it? What's, what's your motivation? There can be several motivations. There can be, I want to continue working on this. Then we're maybe talking in perspective one to five years or so. So me, myself, I want to pick this up at a later point. This is what we call active storage. How to put the data somewhere where it is easily accessible to me again. It becomes much more interesting when we look into longer time frames, 10 years, 20 years, um, and also in the, the whole idea of, of reusing data, so that data that I don't use for my research anymore, somebody else comes, picks it up, and does something interesting with it. And that's where we really come to the, to the point where the data needs to be, people need to know the data is there, but they also need to know what is in the data and how they can use it. And uh, um, so we, we are storing all this data and, uh, and as you said, maybe one can use them himself or herself mm-hmm. or maybe someone else can access them. So uh, at the current status, so let's say right now, um, what are the different ways to make the data accessible and reusable by external users? I mean, a lot of the, the knowledge in science is transmitted still in the form of papers, in the form of publications. So if you want a report about a scientific finding that is based on some data. But typically the the paper itself does not include the data or not all the data. It just includes uh, bits and pieces here and there to really show what you've done and to prove that where you arrived at was was, was valid given the, the, the experiments you've done. What people used to do maybe 10 years ago is 20 years ago, they would write, um, data are available on request. That's kind of the the good old way of doing this. And uh, there was a quite interesting study in 2014 where they actually went and looked at, I think, nearly 600 papers that said something like this. Data is available on request or data can be downloaded here and, you know, a printed web address. And the result of this paper was that basically this model doesn't work. So every year, um, 17% of data gets lost. A better way to do it, and the, sort of the way that we now consider the best way, is to use um, public repositories for data. They are like forever, they have permanent identifiers, but they're also um, domain specific. And in fact, in biology, we have like the, the Protein Data Bank. This was founded in 1971. In its first release, it contained the... So this is a database for the structure of proteins. And in its first release, it contained just eight proteins. By now, it's the de facto standard for, for the exchange of, um, of protein structural data and is sort of the place where you put a structure. So if you can... If you have these kind of repositories available to you that are clearly domain specific and sort of the thing that is internationally used by everybody that's kind of the best pla- the best place to put this information because everybody knows where to pick it up afterwards La comunità scientifica ha già cominciato ad affrontare la questione della condivisione dei dati e nel 2016 sono state pubblicate delle linee guida per farlo principi che vanno sotto il nome di fair data ovvero dati equi 
I've heard of this uh, FAIR data. Could you please explain us what, what they are? FAIR has a little bit a different approach in not so much focusing on openness and uh, free availability, let's say, but rather focusing on if data is available, it should be made available in a way that it can actually be capitalized on. So FAIR, the acronym, F is for findable. So there's no use that there's a data set out there, but I don't know how to find it. And findable also brings up the important topic of metadata. If I don't know what's in the data, just knowing that there is a data set is of little value. The A in FAIR is accessible. If there is this data set, I need to know how I can get it, where I can get it. I stands for interoperable. This is maybe the biggest contrast to, to, to the open data movement in that this is now a very strong focus saying basically data should be readable by humans and by machines. So use common formats, document the formats. And then R in FAIR stands for reusable. Provide the data in a format with the proper annotation, with the proper metadata. You, you see I'm saying metadata a lot, but that's really what is key here. From personal experience, we once received in a project, we received two USB drives with data that were measured at another group. Um, this was sort of kind of discarded data, really. They had tried to do something else, but they had this data lying around. We wanted to do something with it. And it was pretty hard to convince them to actually go the extra effort, provide us with the data. And then at some point we had these two um, USB drives and they were full with folders that were called with numbers. 127, 509, in the folders were files that had similar non-clear file names um, that probably made sense to somebody who had sort of the master list, but it made no sense to us. So in the end, we had two hard disks that were full of data, but we couldn't do anything with it. How much effort uh, are we putting into this uh, open data and fair data? I think we're not putting enough effort in it. And I think one of the big things is so now it's often perceived as something you have to do because the funder wants it to do. If it's not perceived as this, then it's perceived as something that you can do to prevent later accusations of fraud. Hopefully that never happens, but you know, somebody might come in the future and say, uh, hey, uh, this data set, can you actually show me this data set? And then the better you've documented and managed your data, the easier it will be to just pull out the right file and say, there it is. Both of these things are if you want more negative incentives. I have to do this to prevent something bad from happening. And I think what we need to, where we need to get to is where data management becomes sexy, you know? Where we have a lot of cases where people say, hey, I found this data set and I could correlate it with this other data set and here's, maybe that's not gonna end up in directly in a paper, but maybe this is where you can look at some things and say, oh, this is an interesting hypothesis. Let me test this in more depth. And the more of these kind of success stories we, we have, the, the, the cooler it actually becomes because you see the benefit of, of, of managing your data well, not only for yourself, but also for, for reuse. You know, just now, um, hopefully slowly coming out of the SARS and COVID pandemic, I think what we've seen in these past one and a half, two years, has been an enormous amount of data sharing. I think we've never been as, as scientists and in the medical profession in a, in a situation where so much data was created in such a short time about a question and made available. Mi domando dove fisicamente finiscono tutte queste stringhe di informazioni digitali. Per scoprirlo mi basta andare nella mia città natale, Lugano, per incontrare la dottoressa Maria Grazia Giuffreda, direttrice associata del Centro Svizzero di Calcolo Scientifico. Maria Grazia, dove ci troviamo? Al Centro Svizzero di Calcolo Scientifico, a Lugano, parte del Politecnico Federale di Zurigo. 
E che cos'è questo centro svizzero di calcolo scientifico? Il centro svizzero di calcolo scientifico è un'infrastruttura di eh, ricerca per mettere a disposizione appunto dei, dei vari scienziati risorse di calcolo e eh, di dati. E quindi è qui che finiscono i dati prodotti dalla ricerca scientifica? È qui che finiscono i dati prodotti dalla ricerca scientifica che eh, fa eh, ricerca, quindi fa calcoli computazionali qui sulla nostra infrastruttura e poi siamo parte di vari progetti europei, quindi dove parte dei dati eh, finiscono anche qui al CSCS. Sì. E voi che tipo di servizi offrite per gli open source e gli open data? Questo è un nuovo aspetto che stiamo sviluppando adesso al CSCS, non solo di come archiviare questi grandi, queste grandi quantità di dati, perché le risorse computazionali diventano sempre più potenti, quindi si producono sempre più dati, ma anche creare servizi che mettano a disposizione questi dati alla comunità, che rendano questi dati accessibili, che rendano questi dati riutilizzabili. Facciamo parte di, un pro di progetti europei come DICE, come Phoenix, dove stiamo cercando e stiamo mettendo su una infrastruttura di dati per permettere ai ricercatori di utilizzare i dati, di rianalizzare i dati, quindi non è più un'analisi dei dati del, del ricercatore che li produce, ma il ricercatore che li produce poi li mette anche a disposizione di tutti coloro di, uh, che possono uh, utilizzarli. E questo anche secondo i principi del fair data? Questo sì, perché i progetti di cui facciamo parte noi e anche i progetti che stiamo mettendo su, noi abbiamo uh, creato, abbiamo anche fatto, annunciato da poco, long term storage, quindi un'archiviazione a lungo termine, dove noi abbiamo messo su un servizio basato appunto sul fair e dove abbiamo anche messo a disposizione questo PID, questo uh, Persistent Data Ad Identifier, dove l'idea è che un ricercatore pubblica i suoi dati, proprio i dati, a, ottiene un PID, hai un identificatore che ti permetterà di ritrovare quei dati, noi garantiamo un minimo di 10 anni, che non è poco per i dati. opportunamente guarniti di metadati, è effettivamente possibile rianalizzare i dati prodotti da altri scienziati. Per farlo bisogna utilizzare un processo informatico chiamato data mining, ovvero scavare nei dati come deminatori per estrarre preziosissime informazioni nascoste sotto una montagna di codici binari. Per capire come funziona il data mining vado a parlare con Michaela Zavolan, professoressa di bioinformatica al Biocentrum dell'Università di Basilea. Why do you data mine and what do you data mine, right? So I, it, you start with, typically with a question. So you're interested in some kind of process and you want to answer certain things about it, then you start thinking, well, okay, what sort of data would I need to be able to answer this question? And maybe the data is available in some public repository, maybe the data you would have to generate in your lab, maybe you need to establish a collaboration and so on. Idea of extracting some kind of pattern from data using whatever, machine learning, uh, statistics, um, computational methods. Right? So then the question is, you know, what is a pattern? And then it kind of depends, of, that determines sort of what tools you use. So how much do you know about the problem? Do you look for things that are um, informed by your prior knowledge or you're looking just some kind of bit relationships between variables or, or something like that? But in general, it's extracting some meaning um, out of data. And of course now you can realize that that immediately um, sort of blends into you generate experimental data is the analysis of your data still part of the study you've <laughs> done initially or is kind of data mining that maybe you need help with uh, done by other people with other kind of uh, skill set. Um, so that's an interesting question we actually run into very often. 
But, but do you somehow like use some uh, open database, uh, something that somehow openly accessible to, to everyone and you just extract, uh, download some database from there? Well, I mean, we of course use information that is available in public databases. So for instance, um, the genome annotation. So if you want to figure out how much gene XYZ is expressed, we need to know where gene XYZ sits in the genome. So of course we use the genome sequence, we use the annotation of the genome transcripts. Um, and there is also, I mean, this, there's different types of publicly available data. So this is just one type. It's very broadly used by pretty much every lab now. Um, but there's other large scale projects um, done by various consortia. For instance, um, the Cancer Genome Atlas is such a very big project. Many cancer groups um, study cohorts of patients with different types of cancers and generate things like RNA sequencing, proteomics, these kind of data sets. And these typically become available quite early. Um, and there's some um, agreements about how the data is to be used, analyzed, published. Um, but so this is another type of data that one could bring into the context of a project that has an experimental part done in one lab, and then it's using maybe um, publicly available data to get sort of validation, to formulate additional hypotheses, to do all kinds of things. Yeah, and this brings us to the, uh, one of the um, up and coming topics of the latest series, like this FAIR data. I don't know if you have ever heard of them, or but what's, what's your opinion on, on this FAIR data? Oh, that, again, it's, it's a problem with multiple aspects. So why would you want to have the data findable, accessible, all this kind of stuff? Um, so as I said, this comes from a different perspective. One is because um, there, is, there are discussions about reproducibility, especially in biomedical science. And um, one would like to have, to check occasionally, you know, how reproducible the results are, and if they're not, then if we have annotation of the data with how the experiment was done, all these kind of things, one can try to trace back why, is, uh, why are the results sort of different between different studies. So that's one angle. The other angle is trying to make most of the data that we generate. So we, I mean, we do generate tons of data all the time. We answer certain questions, but those questions are generally sort of smaller than actually what the data might be able to, to tell you. And so why not reuse what is there instead of spending more money to generate an initial data set? Um, so that's kind of a, a nice um, sort of efficiency type of argument, making more of the data, which of course comes with additional caveats, which is just sort of very simply, data that was generated on some platform 10 years ago, maybe it's easily, easily findable nowadays, but presumably the resolution and the accuracy and all these kind of things are not comparable with what we can get with similar kind of measurements today. Or um, the design of the metadata, what, whatever we decided to keep information about it was much more limited than what we would think of, of keeping now. Or are able to also get at the same time from the same kind of machines now. So um, I'm, I think it's a great idea to try to make the most of the data that we generate. And we can only do that if the data is accessible to others and other people can look at it. It, of course, comes with some, some caveats. And it's not always the case, um, or it's sort of generally it's not sort of equally useful, the, the different data that you get from different places and from different eras, <laughs> um, they're not all equally useful. La ricerca di base in ambito biologico si coniuga direttamente con lo sviluppo di farmaci e terapie mediche. Vorrei davvero sapere come le industrie del settore massimizzano i risultati prodotti dai propri laboratori. Per questo motivo contatto via mail il colosso farmaceutico Roche che nel 2020 ha investito oltre 11 miliardi di franchi nella ricerca e sa bene che vuol dire efficienza. Mi spiegano che il riciclaggio di dati è estremamente importante per Roche. Incrociare i risultati di precedenti test clinici permette loro di formulare nuove ipotesi anche se si è trattato di terapie che magari non hanno raggiunto gli scaffali delle farmacie. Infatti 
Per sviluppare un nuovo farmaco vengono inizialmente testate migliaia di diverse molecole parallelamente. I test si fanno sempre più stringenti, finché non restano solo una decina di composti da sperimentare su pazienti volontari. Ma solo uno verrà approvato per la commercializzazione. Tutta la mole di dati prodotti, compresi quelli dei composti scartati, viene incrociata con quella proveniente da altre ricerche, anche se effettuate in un contesto molto diverso. In questo modo potrebbero evidenziarsi correlazioni biomediche inaspettate, come ad esempio dei marker biologici nuovi o effetti terapeutici altrimenti impossibili da prevedere. Nella loro mail, gli esperti di Roche evidenziano che utilizzare i dati solo una volta rallenterebbe inevitabilmente il progresso medico e scientifico. Rovistare nei propri archivi permette invece di allargare il bacino dal quale attingere le informazioni, permettendo ai ricercatori di interrogarle ad ampio respiro. Seguendo i principi dei FAIR Data, Roche si dice anche disponibile a condividere i propri dati con laboratori esterni attraverso la piattaforma Vivli. Se le motivazioni a supporto della richiesta di accesso alle informazioni è approvata da una commissione indipendente, gli scienziati possono accedere ed analizzare i dati prodotti da Roche, con l'obbligo di rendere pubblici tutti i risultati prodotti con essi. La risposta di Roche mi insegna due lezioni fondamentali. La prima è quanto sia importante coordinare diverse linee di ricerca per sfruttare al massimo le proprie risorse. La seconda è che utilizzare dati prodotti da altre persone pone delle questioni etiche non banali. Le affronto con un esperto di filosofia bioetica, il dottor David Shaw dell'Institute for Biomedical Ethics dell'Università di Basilea. It can be uh, ethically problematic to share data for, for reasons, for various reasons, uh, but it can also be uh, problematic to not share data uh, for other reasons. More recently in medical research and biomedical research, there's been a move towards open data. And the basic idea behind that being the public, to a large extent, is paying for this research, and it would be wasteful not to let other researchers and maybe sometimes the public access this data to see what's going on. And so that brings us back to the ethical issues, which is um, depending on the data type, um, the main questions are, does this data link to any people, any members of the public? Um, do any scientists have intellectual claims over uh, this data or, or ownership rights over this data? Um, and could anyone be harmed potentially by sharing this data? The assumption is you will share data unless there's a good reason for doing so. Um, and so it, it really depends on the type of cellular or molecular biology data. And then you can get into a discussion about, well, if the data is purely anonymized, it's not linked to people anymore, there's probably not a reason why you can't share it. But then again, with increasing use of big data and artificial intelligence technologies, even using the word anonymized can be problematic. Unless you're, if you're engaged in purely open data, you put the data somewhere and anyone can use it for any purpose, no, no strings attached, that's kind of easier. But um, if, on the other hand, if you're not doing open data, sometimes it's on a request basis. So someone wants to use your data, they'll ask you, you share the data with them under uh, certain terms and conditions, um, which would normally stipulate something to do with intellectual property either we retain any rights in the intellectual property that results from your use of that data, um, or we waive uh, any intellectual property rights in anything to do with that data. People think data is their data. Patients think that. Hospitals sometimes speak in that way. Researchers, I think, sometimes speak of it as being their data. But the idea of owning data, I think, is problematic. Um, and you can control data and you can process it and so on. But um, if once you share your data with someone, I don't think it helps to say it's their data now. Um, that just complicates things even further, even if it's convenient to, for people to think about owning data. It's more about who has rights to access certain data. Spesso gli accordi tra persone non sono facili da trovare e questo rende viscoso il processo di pubblicazione e riutilizzo delle informazioni. Cambiando la prospettiva, però, Condividere i dati non è solo un modo per permettere ad altri di rispondere a nuove domande, ma anche una garanzia di integrità e trasparenza dell'intero processo scientifico. 
uh, this idea of open data, uh, also in terms of reproducibility. Do you think there is, a, in this sense, a need for open data? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so you're right. So I touched on the kind of one of the justifications, which is the public are paying for this, um, or even if the public aren't paying for it, it improves science. If the data is used more, it avoids research waste. Whereas some laboratory science, people should be keeping logs and so on and, and keeping metadata and everything like that. And so it's not enough to simply publish your results um, and maybe have some raw data. You need to give, every, give anyone who wants it, really, the data and the metadata and maybe the syntaxes or whatever that are necessary to, as you say, reproduce uh, the results. And that's to ensure the integrity of the data and the integrity of the science. Um, but, but it's not just reproducibility. It's someone could take that same data and do something very valid, but quite a diff take it in quite a different direction uh, as well. So yeah, I think there is, it's not, open data is moving away from trying to prevent harm, which could result from sharing data, although we still think about that, and thinking of the benefits that can result uh, from sharing data. And this brings us uh, um, a bit to um, another, another thing um, that we almost uh, touched, which are the FAIR data. Yes. Uh, the, um, do you know them? Find, I, I forget the abbreviation now, but it's findable, yeah. accessible, Access interpretable and... Reusable. Yes, exactly. So, so do you think yeah, there are a concrete uh, solution to this problem? Um, what's your take on yeah. that? Well, I mean, I think the FAIR principles are, are interesting. I mean, I appreciate what they're trying to do with the fear principles, but it's almost like because it says fear, it sounds like a really ethical uh, thing to do. Um, but if you actually look at what the letters stand for, um, that is good in terms of open data, but you also need to think about ethical issues. It's not like it covers uh, all the ethical issues uh, in there simply because it says uh, fear. So I think the fear requirements are good, but you need to, for most or for much of science, there is this tension in the fear principles. Um, I mean, I think they're good generally, but journals shouldn't make it impossible for researchers to give justifications for not always depositing all of their data or maybe redacting it. I mean, I, whatever the type of research you're doing, I think journals and funders and institutions should avoid the idea that one size fits all, whether it's data sharing or uh, other or research ethics or research integrity. I mean, I guess that the solution is just to, um, to be proportionate. And so maybe the default should be, yes, fair, but don't, as some journals do, or, or some journals seem to be doing, uh, you shouldn't have to get into a lengthy argument with editors about the good reasons why you have to make an exception to the fair principles. Sometimes editors act as if you're being outrageous by raising these ethical concerns that go in the other direction. Uh, whereas in fact, there can be good reasons for, uh, for not doing that. Forse il mio entusiasmo è eccessivo. Il percorso per la condivisione dei dati non è semplice e in alcuni casi possono esserci delle buone motivazioni per non intraprenderlo. There's also another concern, which is the problem of dual use. Um, so du dual use is when um, you've done some research, it was important, you've found out some good things about people's health, for example, stopping people smoking. Um, but there was a case in Scotland where one of the tobacco companies tried to get hold of the data done by some health researchers because they wanted to use the same data to try and get people to smoke. But for example, people could use maybe, I don't know, gene editing data to try and uh, bioengineer some kind of weapon or something like that, which is a classic example of dual use. And so that's another reason why you might want to exempt your research from open data. It's not a major ethical issue, but I've been reading more recently about the environmental consequences of storing so much data. Um, and you, I think an argument could be made that there should be some kind of time limitation on it, um, or at least avoid duplication of data sets un unnecessarily, um, because servers use electricity and uh, sea, sea levels are rising. So that's a, it's a kind of like, it's more environmental ethical concern rather than one to do with the data. But, um, 
we're trying to avoid wasting data, yes, but there will come a point for some data sets at which it becomes wasteful to continue to keep them, I think. And by that point, people have had fair opportunity to reuse them. There's probably been reanalyses done and we still have the results of studies done using that data, so I don't think it's necessary to keep that data in perpetuity. Porre i dati apertamente fruibili ha un incredibile potenziale scientifico in termini di risorse economiche, di trasparenza e di metodo investigativo, ma presenta non trascurabili difficoltà teoriche e pratiche. Quindi, i dati prodotti dalla ricerca dovrebbero essere resi disponibili a tutti? That's a really hard question. Well, I mean, the, again, there's many angles from which this uh, question needs to be addressed. In principle, yes, but in practice, there are many caveats. È assolutamente importante che i dati siano available e siano open per tutta la comunità scientifica.